On many of our videos, there's someone who comments something like, Reagan ruined the middle class with trickle-down economics. Why don't you ever talk about that? Okay, let's talk about it. Trickle-down economics is a pejorative term that Will Rogers coined to bash Herbert Hoover. And it's how they bash Ronald Reagan, too. They're just describing low tax rates for the rich as trickle-down economics. Because when rich people invest money, they create jobs and opportunities for the rest of us. That's the trickling down part. So why is that a bad thing? Because they say it doesn't work. They say if a rich man pays less in taxes, he'll just get richer and richer while the rest of us become poorer. But they never stop to think how the rich actually get richer. But let's come back to that point in a minute. We often hear politicians say that the government should invest in things. Infrastructure, green energy, science, the arts. They speak very highly of investing when it comes to the government. But here's the thing. The government can't invest in things. They can only spend money on things. Investing implies that they can make a profit and that wealth can be created. But government can't create wealth. They can only take it and spend it. Investing in infrastructure just means spending money on infrastructure. There is no investment. There is no return on the money spent. We need good roads, and that's something we might want to spend money on. But it's not an investment. It's not like we're going to sell the roads later and make a profit. So how do the rich get richer? By investing their money. And that's a good thing. Let me give you an example. If a wealthy person decides to open up a restaurant, between the manager, bartenders, barbacks, waiting staff, busboys, hosts, chef, cooks, runners, and the cleaning crew, it'll create at least 25 jobs. And that rich person's investment just trickled down to 25 people. But that's just a small part of the picture. This restaurant would need a building, so they'd have to either rent, buy, or build one. They'd have to hire an architect to draw up some plans, a general contractor to execute those plans, carpenters, electricians, painters, and a construction crew to do the work. They'd have to buy materials that truck drivers would have to deliver. They'd need to find food suppliers, vegetables from local farmers, meat from a ranch, and seafood from the coast. They'd have to buy an oven, a grill, a deep fryer, and a refrigerator. They would need tables, chairs, and linens, plates, cups, and silverware. They'd have to buy a security system and a POS system. And all of those items and services require materials to manufacture and manpower to create and deliver them. There are literally thousands of people who would benefit from a person investing their money in opening up a restaurant. That's trickle-down economics. But really, that's just how a market economy works. We're all connected through the cooperation of capitalism. Now, about that shrinking middle class, it's true that it's shrinking, but most people have moved up, not down. According to the Pew Research Center, since the beginning of Ronald Reagan's first term to 2015, the percentage of adults living in the middle income tier has decreased by 9 percentage points. But two-thirds of those people have moved up above the middle income tier. Let's look at the numbers according to the U.S. Census Bureau statistics. In 1967, 53% of households made between thirty-five dollars and 100000 a year. That's in 2016 dollars. But by 2016, that number was only 42%. That's a 20% decrease in the percentage of middle-class households over the past 50 years. That sounds bad, doesn't it? But get this. In that same period, the percentage of households making less than 35000 a year has also decreased by almost 25%. So if the middle and lower income households have decreased in percentage, that can only mean one thing. The percentage of households making more than 100 k a year have increased. And they have increased by a whopping 250%. In 1967, only 8% of households made the equivalent of more than $100,000 a year. And by 2016, almost 28% of households made more than 100 k a year. The middle class is shrinking, but it's because people are moving up, not down. Isn't that what we want? Well, I'm not sure that's what Democrats want. They want the opposite of what they call trickle-down economics. They want the redistribution of wealth. And the ironic thing is that they believe that giving money to the poor boosts the economy. Why would it? Because they say that the poor will spend that money. But when the owner of the Washington Redskins spends $100 million on a yacht, they criticize him as if that money doesn't go into the economy. Do they think that yachts are built by robots? That no maintenance is needed? No fuel, no crew, no marina fees? Do we really believe that people living hand-to-mouth on welfare pump more into the economy than the wealthy do? 
Ultimately, what I think it comes down to is that the Democrats want as many people on the government dole as possible. They want to give out as much welfare as they can because they think that will trickle down to the ballot box. And that's the simple truth. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, subscribe to our channel. And if you want to become a supporting member of Blue Collar Logic, check out the links in the description and give what you can. Somewhere right now, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is enjoying the first few days out of the spotlight since her swearing in. All of the attention has just shifted to Robert Francis Beto O'Rourke. All of the crazy love from the left and all the crazy hate from the right. I live in California, so when the left goes goo-goo-eyed over somebody, you feel it here almost like an earthquake. Here's Beto just walking into the room at Bill Maher's studio in LA, almost exactly one year ago. Listen to that crowd. That's a small studio audience. They love this guy. Why? Because he was running against Ted Cruz for senator in Texas. And his platform was basically this, no wall. He was also still riding on the viral video in which he said that he could think of nothing more American than football players taking a knee during the national anthem. Yeah, LA Democrats were loving this guy. California progressives would like to annex Texas. The state capital is already in the bag. If somebody was to blindfold you and drop you down in the hip district of Austin, you might think you were in one of LA's trendier areas, or maybe Portland, Oregon. LA has been franchising itself for decades, and they have their sights set on Texas. Ask any red-blooded Texan if migration from Cali is changing the place. But Beto mania isn't just that. Beto is seen by old liberals with a lifetime of politics as just the thing to send Donald Trump packing. I mean, think about it. Here's a guy born and raised in a border town. Literally, El Paso is on our southern border. And to hear Beto talk about illegal immigration, you'd think he was discussing a lively cultural exchange program with no downside. He loves immigrants from Latin America, legal or not. He has said in interviews that he would like to tear down the wall between Juarez and his own hometown. If you could, would you take the wall down now, here? Yes. Like you have a wall. Absolutely. Like, knock it down. I'd take the wall and down. Do you think the city, you think if, this, if there's a referendum here in this city, that would pass? I do. El Paso is one of the safest cities in the U.S., and Beto will be the first to tell you that. Of course, he doesn't mention that just across the border barrier, Juarez is a notoriously dangerous place. I guess that wall there is just a coincidence. O'Rourke will be running on three or four typical hard left issues green jobs slash climate change, a national living wage, and single-payer government health insurance. Of course, he's gotten the memo, and he'll always, always call that Medicare for all. Oh, and immigration reform, but not the kind you want. So here's this guy who loves Mexican immigrants, speaks fluent Spanish, and actually grew up on the border, who is the best progressive communicator since Barack Obama. This dude is good. He can take questions for hours and give exactly the sorts of answers that have been field tested with progressives since young Robert O'Rourke was in an expensive prep school outside DC making connections. But he never forgets to say that he wants to serve all Americans, regardless of ideology. But wait, the demos really want to put a woman of color in the White House. It's on their aging radical bucket list. And if a white guy wins for their party in 2020, many of the baby boomers will not live to see a female president. As I've said in other videos, the plan was this. Black president, woman president. President of color, probably meaning Hispanic. And then either an openly gay POTUS or a Muslim. That's the bucket list. But many of these progressives are turning 70 and they need to compress woman and of color into a single candidate. So unless Michelle Obama flips the script and runs, we're looking at Kamala Harris. So where does Beto O'Rourke come in? Well, I'll tell you. If we have a female president, the demos will feel very good about having a male VP, even a white one. This would potentially give them 16 years with which to turn the US into their political wet dream, an enormous land of collectivist happiness with government agencies in every facet of life from sea to shining sea. But this means a vice president who likes people who likes rolling up his sleeves and getting out there with the ordinary folks. O'Rourke is Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden rolled into one. 
and a whole lot younger than either of them. And he reminds them of another great lost opportunity, Bobby Kennedy. The guy looks like Bobby, a taller, slightly nerdy version of that long lost hero. The more new agey progressives might even think he is Bobby Kennedy. You know, reincarnation and all. RFK was assassinated in 68, and O'Rourke was born in 72. Oh, I've heard them fall for stranger ideas. Okay, back to Earth. Bobby Kennedy will forever be linked to Martin Luther King Jr. because they were murdered in the same year. White liberals consider JFK's younger brother to be a civil rights warrior, untouched by scandal, whose death brought the summer of love to a crashing halt. Mix all of this together, and you have Beto O'Rourke running for VP with Kamala Harris, or Michelle Obama, which would be even better for them. Progressives imagine Beto spending eight years as feminist in chief, touring the colleges to standing room only crowds and talking about how fantastic it is to be nearby as a woman of color runs the country. Eight years as the ultimate Beto male. And then when it's his turn, he'd win it at a walk, being the hero to all of those former college students who ever met him at their alma mater. So yeah, Laugh at all the dumb Beto jokes. Have fun telling each other how shocking it is that he wrote a short story about running over children for a thrill. Get all high and mighty about his drunk driving offenses or his other youthful indiscretions. I'll be over in the corner posting videos that prove he has zero musical talent. Sorry, I'm shallow that way. But none of us should take this dude lightly. This guy is good. Unless the doxers come up with something a hell of a lot darker than a creepy short story, Kamala Harris has her running mate, and with him by her side, she can win. So what do we deplorables do about it? I wonder what we can do. Let's listen to O'Rourke himself, here seen actually wearing sheep's clothing. <laughs> Maybe he'll have some answers. What should we do, Beto? What should we do? Well, that wasn't very helpful. Maybe you guys will have a better plan. Leave your comments below. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, subscribe to our channel and then click the little bell to get notifications. The other day I was working in a low income area and I met a single mother and her teenage daughter. It was a Tuesday afternoon and the daughter was walking about the apartment complex wearing her pajamas and a blanket. They both reeked of weed and cigarettes and the mother had the look of someone who's made more than a few questionable decisions in her life. The daughter starts telling her mother about how her friend had already received her phone and that it only took 14 days and that was unfair because they had to wait 54 days to get their phones. She was upset because her friend got her government provided phone faster than she got hers. These were trashy people. And please, let me explain how trashy. The daughter was looking at pictures of her friends on her government provided phone, and she leaned over and showed her mom and said, look how beautiful she is. She's like porn star beautiful. I'm sorry, but it doesn't get much trashier than that. And that's what government dependency looks like. The big government types will argue that these ladies don't want to live like that, in Section 8 housing and waiting weeks to get a free smartphone. They just don't have any opportunities, you know, because of greedy capitalism or something. But maybe this teenager could be in school making good grades instead of getting high with her mom on a Tuesday afternoon. Or maybe she should have gotten a job at McDonald's and bought herself a phone. Now, I've been lucky enough in my life to have lived in a few different countries, rural areas and big urban cities, and I've met many different kinds of people. And in doing so, I've learned a lot about the human condition. We can adapt to and accept almost anything. The reason that a lot of people don't strive to get out of a bad neighborhood, or a bad relationship for that matter, is for that reason. We can easily lower our expectations. Humans have no problem justifying their existence, no matter how unacceptable it might be to others. This teenage girl will likely live her whole life dependent on the system. Not because she's unable to work, and not because she's stupid or lazy, but because she's accepted that this way of life is all right with her. 
she doesn't see the need to change it. She'll continue to complain about what she doesn't have and how it's unfair, but since her expectations are so low, that'll be fine with her. Well, it's not fine with me. America is based on the idea that an individual should be independent. And if people determine their own fate, our society will be better off. Dependence is the complete opposite of what America is about. Dependence creates weakness. Dependence creates low expectations. Dependence stifles freedom. This girl can be anything she wants to be, but being dependent on the system has given her the option of being a nobody, the option of doing nothing, and it's made that option acceptable. When I was about eight years old, my father and I were at a red light and a beggar was standing there with a sign that read, I need work. I asked my dad, why don't you give him five dollars? My father answered, son, let me show you something. He rolled down his window and offered the guy some painting and yard work. The guy was very appreciative and thanked him profusely. Well, about a week went by and the bum never showed up. My dad explained to me that as long as people are giving this guy money for doing nothing, he's not going to make a change and start working for it. We're enabling people like this to be bums. We often hear about the negative effects of enabling when it comes to drug addiction. An enabler will make a drug addict worse by making it possible for them to continue to do drugs without suffering the consequences of their actions. And just like an enabler will hurt a person who has a drug dependency problem, enabling somebody with a government dependency problem hurts them. So how do we solve this? Should there be work requirements for the mom to be eligible for Section 8 housing? Should the teenager have to make good grades or be employed to qualify for a taxpayer-funded phone? Should they have to pass a drug test? We have to do something to stop able-bodied people from abusing the system. And don't get me wrong, it's easy to see that this girl has some disadvantages. Her dad's not around, her mom is letting her get high and skip school. But I think that's more of a reason that we can't allow capable people to get away with becoming dependent on the system. We often call it abusing the system, but I don't think most recipients start out with the intention of abusing the system. Just like most people who use drugs don't intend to become addicts. The system itself makes abusing it very easy. It makes it very comfortable. There is no shame in being dependent on the taxpayer. There's no shame in complaining about how they didn't get their free stuff fast enough. In front of me, the taxpayer working his butt off who paid for that phone. She's totally unaware that the UPS driver who delivered it paid for that phone and the maintenance man who fixed their toilet while I was there. As long as we don't make the needy fulfill some kind of a requirement to get their assistance, they will never have a need to better their situation. If a young adult grew up in a poor neighborhood and that's all she knows and you make it easy for her to stay in that neighborhood, she will because it's all she's ever known. It's time we start making the less fortunate take strides to make themselves more fortunate. If you need help paying the bills, that's fine, but you have to show us that you're working toward being able to pay them yourself. The free rides for able-bodied people have got to stop. Requiring them to get their act together will not only improve the quality of their life, but it will improve our society as a whole. It's time we stop paying people to do nothing. And that's the simple truth. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, subscribe to our channel. And if you want to become a supporting member of Blue Collar Logic, check out the links in the description and give what you can. So until you do it, I'm the boss. That's How right. about that? You heard it here. Of course, that is Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez having one of her Supergirl moments. In fairness, this comes after a rather touching admission that she often looks in the mirror and doubts her own qualifications. Or at least she did until an email questioning the same thing woke up her inner feminist. That email made her say, I don't care anymore. I don't care anymore. Now she's completely confident. She's the boss, people. The Democrats are so lost, so confused after doing nothing but hating the big orange man for two years that they are completely undone by this photogenic young woman spouting Marxist tropes. They've spent two years trying to sabotage the president with fake Russian collusion, and here comes AOC killing it with reheated Bernie Sanders shtick. They're wondering, did we back the wrong horse in 2016? Suddenly, all the candidates jostling for position are signing on to the Green New Deal, which was a joke when Jill Stein was pushing it. They're trying desperately to cop a little bit of that AOC magic, 
There's just something about her. She's so young, so not ruined by the game, so not cynical like they used to be when they still had souls. Oh, how she takes them back. After all, weren't they even younger than AOC when they had that awesome rap session on the roof of the dorm with that fiery revolutionary exchange student from one of those shithole countries down where Central America gets real skinny? Ah, those were the days. Che Guevara posters on the wall, quotes from the little red book scrawled on the peachy folders. Oh, to be young again. Oh, to be a cute woman of color rising up out of the proletariat to lead the charge into the future of equality and social justice. Who cares about age? Who cares about real world experience? Fidel Castro was only 32 when he first led his army against Batista's corrupt regime. Che Guevara was even younger and neither of them knew much of anything about the real world or human nature. Did they let that stop them? No. And why should AOC let the doubter slow her down? Like Shay, she's taken a quick glance at the disparities that exist in society and determined that the playing field must be flattened by government. Really, really big government. Huge, ponderous, field-flattening government. She's come up with a kitchen sink plan so radically unbound by knowledge or common sense that it must be destiny. It's too crazy to be anything else. All of those nights in capitalist bondage, slaving away, making $12 cocktails for bougie young execs overhearing people say stuff, pouring another IPA and thinking, you know, about like injustice and all? How could she not become radicalized? How could she not gird her loins and put together a grassroots campaign funded by donations and tip money and unseat Joe Crowley? Except that's not really how it happened, is it? No, not really. In fact, AOC is not exactly Jenny from the block. You wonder why she speaks just like a suburban girl from Westchester County? Well, that's because she is one. Her parents moved from the Bronx to Lily White Yorktown Heights before Alexandria hit first grade. She grew up there and only then took advantage of a bunch of Hispanics only scholarships that put her through college. It was after that that she moved back to New York to be where the action was. And maybe she did make some half-hearted attempts at community organizing, but she didn't build a campaign from the scraps lying around. She was literally, to use her favorite word, recruited by a progressive PAC called Justice Democrats. They put out a call for candidates, you know, like America's Got Talent. She responded, and the young hustlers who run the PAC knew a star when they saw one. You know the guy who managed her campaign and now works for her as chief of staff? He's the guy now being looked at for some shady dealings? His name is Saikat Chakrabarty. He's a Silicon Valley millionaire who decided to get into the Kingmaker game. The PAC was founded by two powerful YouTube super progressives, Cenk Uger of the Young Turks and Kyle Kalinske of Secular Talk, for the express purpose of taking over Congress. Uger and Kalinske say they're no longer with the Justice Democrats. Hmm. AOC isn't the only person they endorsed. They endorsed a whole bunch of intersectional young people of color, like Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib. But it was AOC that they really created. She had no ambitions toward public office before these young rich idealists came along looking for a working class girl with a big personality and a look tailor made for internet stardom. You see, her district was ripe for a takeover. Joe Crowley is, pardon the expression, an old white man, a typical machine politician lounging comfortably in a seat that he never thought he'd be booted out of. His plan was to take over for Nancy Pelosi, if she ever retires. There are no Republicans in the 14th district and white people are only 18% of the population. The other 82% is what demos call of color. And the overwhelming majority of them are Hispanic. So yeah, a young telegenic woman who speaks Spanish and had been building a Twitter presence since 2010, signed this girl up. The Green New Deal, there ain't nothing new about it. That thing was first seen making the rounds of hard left environmentalists in Europe at least a decade ago. It was swiped by the Green Party and used to construct the platform that Jill Stein ran on in both 2012 and 2016. Psycat Chakrabarty graduated from Harvard, worked on Wall Street for a while, and then went west and built two successful tech companies. And then he got the itch for power. That's when he went to work for, guess who? Bernie Sanders. It was 2015, Psycat was 29. He's no dummy, this guy. He saw firsthand what the demos did to Bernie. He knew that white was out, male was out, 
and old was quickly going out. He knew that a young female of color was the way into politics and power. And just like that, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Not only does she trigger revolutionary memories in the old guard demos sitting in Congress like overfed cats, she plays Twitter politics like nobody else on earth. Nobody except Donald Trump, that is. So here's the game. Trump won because he spoke directly to the people. He focused on the working class because he'd been paying attention and knew that the Democrats had turned away from them. The demos had wandered off into the thicket of endless victim groups, locking down a voting block here and a voting block there, while also giving young white kids just out of college a chance to play hero by calling everybody to the right of them a bigot. That has played for a while, but it's just about played out. And Chakrabarty understood that. He saw a 70-something commie throwback almost steal the nomination from Hillary Clinton, who is the poster child for entrenched politicians beholden to big money. Say what you will about Bernie. He knows how to connect with young idealists and old ones who are a little bit ashamed of having left the revolution for a desk job. So don't think of AOC as a politician. Think of her as Saikat Chakrabarty's latest startup. He knows how to build a brand and get the word out. And he looks like a capitalist to me. So what now? Now we sit back and watch. We watch all of the would-be candidates clawing for position, trying to reinvent themselves as socialist champions of the working man and woman. We watch as AOC expertly uses social media to charm her way ever further into the hearts of the 18 to 34 year old voters. If Chakrabarty can stay out of jail, he'll spend the next few years tinkering with the code. He'll adjust and readjust AOC's algorithms until she is as user-friendly as the Google homepage. I should really know better, but I can't resist making a prediction, so grain of salt, okay? Watch for Ocasio-Cortez to back down from the New Green Deal after the current crop of Democratic presidential wannabes make idiots out of themselves defending it. I like, guess what? I made a mistake. Deal with it. Watch for the demos to divide along that line, with stalwarts like Dianne Feinstein pushing back hard against the new communists. I think that the Justice Democrats are counting on Trump winning in 2020. That will put Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in the catbird seat. She'll be 35 with tens of millions of Twitter followers and five years in Congress when she throws her hat into the ring for 2024. Yeah. Sorry, aging radicals, but no new Castro for you. It's going to be a slow burn charm offensive with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez gradually mastering the script. And if there is any sort of worker's paradise coming, it will look a lot more like Canada than it will like Cuba. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, subscribe to our channel and then click the little bell to get notifications. As many of you know, I've spent the last 30 years of my life in the Los Angeles musical community. Lately, it feels less like a community than an ongoing attempt to drive conservatives into the sea. But over the years, I've had a lot of good friends, and politics is something that we've usually left at the door. I was a Democrat, you see, but a moderate one. Five years ago, as identity politics gradually took over the party, and the dialogue became ever more political and less tolerant of dissent, I found myself under attack on a regular basis. Naturally, I reached out more to conservatives, and I ended up where I am now. But back when I was still admired in that crowd, there were certain topics that could not be discussed no matter how carefully. On Facebook, a person could only agree and agree strongly, or that person, usually me, would be suddenly unfriended and blocked. The most dangerous of these topics was abortion. I had become friends with a couple who lived on a hilltop in Malibu. He was in the music business, and she was a dancer, a beautiful woman. Smart, too. Just about 50, but in that sort of physical shape that you only see west of the 405 in Southern California. They had no kids. That's important to this story. Eventually, she and I got into it on Facebook. A mutual friend had posted something that mocked pro-life activists. I, still a Democrat, said something like the following. Look, I'm a pro-choice guy. But if I believed in my heart of hearts that since Roe v. Wade, 50 million children had been murdered, if I believed that, then fighting to end abortion would be my only moral choice. The shitstorm was immediate and as vicious as I'd ever seen it. 
I was attacked from all sides, called a misogynist, told that I was oppressing women and trying to kill them. You know, the old back alley coat hanger abortion scenario. And the dancer I'd befriended led the attack. Remember, I had simply tried to explain the moral motivation of pro-life people, that pro-lifers believed they are fighting organized child murder. I had not said one word about joining that movement myself. I'd simply tried to humanize that side of the argument. The dancer blocked me that day, and I've never heard from her or her husband since. That ugly scene left me asking myself this question. Why are pro-abortion women so damned enthused about the cancellation of a baby? Why are these feminists so happy to have halted the development of 25 million girls since abortion was declared legal? You know me, I have a theory. Let's go back to who this woman is, because she's typical in so many ways of the abortion enthusiasts. Most of the hardline pro-abortion feminists I know are childless. They grew up at a time when the pill became available and the sexual revolution encouraged them to freely express themselves sexually. These women lived in licentious times. They'd been taught by their feminist leaders that women were empowered by casual sex and legal abortion made that safe for them. They were pursuing careers and thought that almost any professional goal would be more fulfilling than raising kids. The last thing they needed was a child to take care of, or two, or three. And so they never had any. And at some point, even if their career goals were reached, they realized that they were leaving nothing of themselves behind in this world. That when they passed on, that was the end of it. Most know that they will outlive their husbands if they have husbands, and that in the end, they will just flicker out like a spent candle. That is not something that a woman in her 50s or 60s wants to think about, especially since many, if not most, of these women did get pregnant at least once, and they flushed that troublesome bunch of cells down the drain. Those discarded fetuses would now be grown children, perhaps dropping by with kids of their own to visit grandma. Beautiful images of a happy matriarch filling her home with her offspring and their offspring must haunt these women like a curse. So how do they deal with that? How do they keep that pain in a lockbox? Well, they do the only thing they can do. They have to turn their decision not to reproduce into a noble action. They must see their decision to abort as a triumph for women and therefore moral. If they cannot believe that their sacrificing of a child or children to the cause was the right thing to do, they'll fall into a dark night of the spirit from which they may never emerge. My heart goes out to them. The last thing I want to do is to punish women who will likely die alone. But there is this one little problem. They are fighting tooth and nail to encourage a whole new generation of young women to make exactly the same mistake. And that's unforgivable. So what do we do when we argue with these women? How do we battle with them without using this insight against them? Because we can't throw this in their faces can we? I suggest that when you debate one of these childless abortion proponents, you phrase it something like this. But aren't you afraid that millions of women will grow old and have no children to visit them, to help them? Aren't you afraid that young women will abort those potential sources of joy and security and never again get the chance to be mothers? Something like that. The goal, after all, is not to destroy the opponent, but to get people to think clearly and fully about the choices they are encouraging young women to make. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, subscribe to our channel and then click the little bell to get notifications. I got a question from my Democratic friends. There are issues that we can legitimately disagree on, but are you guys all in on transgender women athletes competing with and against biological women? Is it okay with you that your daughter might have to face a biological male in the 100 meter dash, or on the wrestling mat, or on the basketball court? Look, I don't know what it's like to be a man and believe I'm actually a woman. It can't be something that's easy to deal with. And I wish nothing but the best to anyone who has that issue. But as far as competing with my daughter in sports goes, I'm sorry, 
It's just not fair. If we're going to let biological males compete with females, then we shouldn't divide sports up by sex. If you think that it's okay for a transgender girl to win the state championship in the 100-meter dash, then you believe, in sports, that we shouldn't divide men and women up at all. I really want Democrats to comment on this video, because the left has made it that your party champions this issue. But I can't imagine that the everyday Democratic voter thinks it's okay. If you Google transgender athletes, you get leftist articles explaining how it's not unfair at all. Because there are rules that a person must have already had one year of hormone therapy to compete, they say that makes it fair. Okay, then why don't we see any transgender men playing in the NBA after taking a year of testosterone? In the only case I could find, it actually worked the other way around. There's a transgender man who put off taking hormones until he retired from the National Women's Hockey League. You see, if the hormones made things fair, he should have taken a year of testosterone and joined the NHL and played against men. But he didn't, because he couldn't. Because even with the hormone therapy, he could never be physically equal to a man. Like I said, I wish every transgender person a content life, but we have to acknowledge that there is a difference between a transgender woman and a woman who was born female. They are physically different. I mean, does this look fair to you? Not allowing Hannah Mouncey, this Australian footballer, to manhandle women on the pitch is in the best interest of women. Have you ever heard of Fallon Fox? She's a transgender female MMA fighter who cracked another fighter's skull. Or how about transgender high school track star Terry Miller? She's the girl state champion sprinter from Connecticut. Or how about tennis great Serena Williams? No, she's not a transgender woman, but she's probably the greatest female athlete of all time. And like John McEnroe pointed out, who got a lot of heat for it, I might add, she can't compete with the best men in her sport because she's a woman. And I know that some feminists will take that as an insult, but if it's true, it can't be an insult. Look, we live in a day and age where men and women have never been more equal in society, but they'll never be equal athletically or physically. And it doesn't matter how many surgeries they get or how many hormones they take, a transgender female has an unfair advantage in women's sports. That's a fact. And allowing them to compete against biological women is not in the best interest of women. And that's the simple truth. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, subscribe to our channel, and if you want to become a supporting member of Blue Collar Logic, check out the links in the description and give what you can. Bernie and the Leftists. Kind of sounds like the name of a terrible rock band, doesn't it? And they only know one song. Leave it till tomorrow to unpack my case. Honey, disconnect the phone back in the USSR. Don't know how lucky you are, boy. Back in the USSR. We should all be so lucky. Look, Bernie and the leftists want to use health care or climate change, or income inequality, or racial division, or any issue really, to take us back to the USSR. And it starts with increasing taxes. And they're always going to approach this issue from the guise of fairness. Is it fair that some people are rich and others are poor? That's what their argument always boils down to. The haves versus the have-nots. But here's the thing. If we all had a billion dollars, we'd all be poor. The value of our wealth isn't in the amount of dollar bills we have or the amount of stuff we own. It comes from how much that stuff is worth. If we all had a billion dollars, a billion dollars wouldn't be worth all that much because it's all relative. Bernie likes to say that the rich have to pay their fair share. So what's fair? Is it fair for one person to not pay taxes while another person has to? Almost half of all Americans don't pay any income tax. And of course, it's many of them that cheer when Bernie says that the top 1% need to pay their fair share. Kind of ironic, isn't it? So who is the top 1% that he always talks about? Who is this small group of people making all the money while the rest of us starve? Well, it turns out that it's not a group of people at all. It's actually different people from year to year. 
A person who's in the top 1% this year will probably not be there next year. You see, they talk about the 1% as if it's a fraternity of old, rich, white men who just won't share the wealth, but it doesn't work out that way. There is a lot of movement in and out of the 1%. Let me give you an example. Let's say a guy starts a plumbing business. He works his butt off, and after 35 years, he has three offices, 15 employees, tons of equipment, and a great reputation in town. Throughout the years, he only took a modest income for himself and put most of his money back into the business to make it bigger and better. So now he wants to retire. After working his whole life as a blue-collar worker and business owner, he sells his business and everything that comes along with it. And just like that, the year he retires, he's in the top 1%. And according to Bernie and the leftists, it's time for him to pay his fair share. They want to take away over half of what took him 35 years to create. Does that seem fair? Is it moral to take away half of what someone's worked for? If a business is satisfying a need that the people have and doing such a great job that more and more people want to use that service or buy that product, where's the problem? If I can create a product that millions of people want more than the money that it costs to buy it, I may get rich, but I would be enriching their lives. How could you possibly justify taking away half or more of my incentive to keep supplying people with something they want? That incentive is what makes companies develop a better version of a product research new ideas, and answer to the concerns of their customers. It's what makes them reactive to the market. But the market is what Bernie and the leftists want to get rid of. They think the market makes things unfair for the poor. Because they don't have as much buying power as the rich, he thinks we'd all be better off if the government just gave us our food rations every day. Most of you that are my age or older can remember seeing pictures of the bread lines in the Soviet Union. I know it sounds like I'm exaggerating, but that's where Bernie and the leftists want to take us. Don't believe me? See for yourself. You know, it's funny. Sometimes American journalists talk about how bad a country is because people are lining up for food. That's a good thing. In other countries, people don't line up for food. The rich get the food and the poor starve to death. Don't forget that it was just a few short years ago, before Venezuelans were eating their pets out of desperation, that Bernie was praising that country. When I lived in the Czech Republic, I got to hear firsthand stories about how terrible it was waiting in line for your rations. Two of them really stuck out to me. The first was about bananas. The country imported bananas to give to all their citizens, but all of their citizens didn't get the bananas they were promised. You see, the state would import enough bananas for everyone, separate them and pass them down to the different regions. The regional leaders would then separate them and pass them down to the smaller districts, and then to the cities, and then to the small towns. But here's the thing. The people in charge of passing them down would always hold a little extra back for themselves. So by the time it got down to the regular citizens, only about half would get their bunch of bananas, and the rest would wait in line all day just to go home empty-handed. The second story is about my friend Jan getting his first bike. It was on his 10th birthday. He went to the bike shop, and there was already one kid waiting. It took about three hours for that kid to get a bike, and then Jan had to wait another three hours to get his bike. He said that the bike had two different size wheels, two different pedals. It had a girl's bike seat, and the chain would fall off a lot. It was just thrown together from a bunch of random bike parts, and there you go. Happy birthday, kid. Here's your government bike. And Bernie Sanders wants us to wait in line to get our government rations? No thank you. I was a teenager when the Berlin Wall fell, which explains why I was so naive, but I never thought fighting communism and socialism and Marxism was going to be a constant struggle. I never imagined at the time that they could ever rebound from the images and the public perception from that time. Who would have thought that so many people in our country could be convinced that any of these closely related ideologies are anything but disastrous? They've been tried time and time again and have never once succeeded. Will we defeat communism again, or will it be invited in to destroy us by our own citizens? Is 2020 the year we embrace the hammer and sickle? I know Bernie supporters can't see the disaster that awaits ahead if he gets elected because they see him as a good guy. But that's the thing about communism, or socialism, or Marxism. It doesn't matter what your intentions are. Once you give that much power to the central government, it always ends the same. So if Bernie gets elected in 2020, you might want to adopt a few big dogs because you're going to need them. And that's the simple truth. Leave it till tomorrow to unpack my case. Honey, disconnect the phone back in the USSR. 
Don't know how lucky you are, boy. Back in the USSR. We should all be so lucky. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, subscribe to our channel. And if you want to become a supporting member of Blue Collar Logic, check out the links in the description and give what you can. Thank you.